Why is there fluoride in our tap water? Writing cavities is the whole idea behind Crest. Fluoride is said to reduce the chance of tooth decay. 75 years of research that confirms the safety of fluoride in your water. Put aside for a second now what your emotions are about it being there. And let's try to answer the question, why is it there? The most common answer that I've heard is that it's good for your teeth. Colgate helps fight cavities. You need that fluoride toothpaste. Fluoridated communities have a 15% lower disease rate in dental disease. Which, sure, it's true to an extent, but why did we start fluoridating tap water in the first place? And if fluoride is added to tap water purely to prevent tooth decay, then why isn't, for example, magnesium added to support the myriad of bodily functions from nerve function to blood sugar and blood pressure regulation, especially since most people are deficient anyways? Iodine added to prevent goiter, thyroid disorders and intellectual disabilities in children, iron for anemia, folic acid for birth defects, vitamin D, potassium, calcium, zinc, or even creatine added to prevent muscle wasted, enhance our cognitive abilities, and give everyone great looking six pack abs. Well, the reason is that all of the justifications for these interventions also have valid counterpoints as why they shouldn't be done. Plus, there's no industry lobby pushing for any of this. And since the only known association with low fluoride intake is the risk of dental caries, then why does this seemingly insignificant benefit outweigh all the known risks and possible downsides of public water fluoridation? Does it really make sense for the government to get involved and put a chemical additive in everyone's water just so you wouldn't get tooth holes? So why is it there? I think dentists are very aware that it's fluoride that prevents dental caries. There's no link between IQ and fluoridated water. There's just a lot of misinformation that is presented out there. The fluoride in our tap water is not the same natural mineral that's found in our fruits and veggies. So whether you're for or against fluoridation, this topic is not as clear and straightforward as people like to believe it is. In its natural form, the way it's present in nature, fluoride is most often in the form of calcium fluoride or fluorspar. It's a common mineral and primarily found in food and water. It's also naturally present in many fresh fruits, such as apples, peaches, strawberries and bananas, as well as in grapes, raisins, potatoes and seafood. But why is it in our tap water? During the 20th century, the aluminium and phosphate fertilizer industries were growing rapidly. And both of these industries emitted significant amounts of fluoride as byproducts. By the mid 20th century, both the aluminium and the phosphate fertilizer industries were facing growing concerns about the environmental impacts of their fluoride emissions. There were reports of vegetation damage and concerns about potential health impacts in areas surrounding these plants. But rather than disposing of this byproduct, which is expensive, both of these industries found it profitable to sell it for water fluoridation. And it was these two industries that were the most actively promoting the health benefits of fluoride. Alcoa, the aluminium company of America, was one of the major aluminium producers in the early 20th century. And in the 1930s, Alcoa funded the research by Dr. Gerald J. Cox to study the dental effects of fluoride. And then naturally, Dr. Cox subsequently became a leading advocate for the fluoridation of public water supplies. However, some might argue that Alcoa's funding and support for fluoride research were motivated by a desire to mitigate potential lawsuits or concerns related to fluoride emissions from their plants. So the primary fluoride compounds added to public water supplies, such as sodium fluoride, hydrofluosilic acid or hexafluorosilic acid, and sodium silicofluoride, are in reality waste products from the aluminum and the phosphate fertilizer industries. And by selling these fluoride waste compounds for water fluoridation, these industries could convert waste products that were expensive to get rid of into a source of revenue. However, while there were clear industrial interests in the promotion of fluoride, it's also true that many independent health organizations and researchers were also studying fluoride's effects at the same time. And the consensus that formed around the benefits of water fluoridation for dental health was not solely based on the industry-backed research. But okay, what's the takeaway here? Well, even after almost a century of fluoridating our water supplies, it still remains unclear whether fluoride is truly essential, although it may have some beneficial effects. So the practice still remains controversial and the science is still not settled. And if anyone's trying to convince you otherwise, they're either lying or ignorant. And as multiple things can be true at the same time, there are valid concerns surrounding water fluoridation. Now, some of you might be thinking it's the dose that makes the poison. And while I doubt there's anyone out there who would argue with the fact that we know excessive levels of fluoride to be harmful, 
What exactly are excessive levels? On average, the levels of fluoride in US tap water are recommended to be between 0.7 and 1.2 milligrams per liter, and the very maximum allowed level set by the EPA is 4.0. However, the reality is that for some municipalities, this number goes up to almost 10, which is more than double the allowed limit. Between 2017 and 2019, nine states and more than 34 utilities had fluoride levels above the legal limits. And another thing to consider is that fluoride exposure is hard to control since water intake varies and fluoride exposure is cumulative. So as only half of what is consumed is excreted, Fluoride, in essence, is a cumulative poison. And there are various exposure pathways from tap water to beverages you buy from stores. It also ends up in our food and other products such as toothpaste or sometimes even salt. As I mentioned in the beginning, although fluoride does have beneficial effects such as strengthening your enamel, it remains very unclear whether putting fluoride in everyone's tap water is truly essential and whether the enamel strengthening benefits outweigh all the possible risks and downside of consuming fluoride. And yes, it does strengthen enamel, for sure. There's no, there's no doubt about that. However, this is Justin McGuire, also known as the Blood Detective. He runs Autonomic Coaching, which is a functional and integrative health coaching service. They excel in advanced functional blood chemistry analysis and figuring out what's actually at the root of your problems. I've been working with Justin for over two years now, after I got severe mold toxicity, and we've just kept it going and optimizing. Now, let's look at what exactly are the legitimate concerns surrounding fluoride exposure. While fluoride is indeed good for your teeth, it's not really that simple. So imagine like a spline chart where the y-axis is dental benefits and the x-axis is like fluoride levels. And what this would look like is a nice arch where up to a certain point fluoride does have beneficial effects on your teeth and then after that we get dental fluorosis as the benefits fall off completely, which is not really what we want. The problem here is that individual fluoride intake is so hard to control, so much so that over half of the children around 8 to 9 years old show signs of dental fluorosis. And while yes, dental fluorosis can be considered a mild cosmetic discomfort, the same doesn't hold true for fluoride's deleterious effects on your thyroid. In it doing so, it can also create a porous structure in its strengthening a certain type of mold. So it doesn't create any benefit to the use of calcium, right? And actually quite on the contrary, because of what it does to the thyroid, it can compromise how the parathyroids regulate calcium and phosphorus. So for me, first and foremost, this is the most concerning negative effects of fluoride. Our thyroid hormones regulate things like metabolism, mental health, body weight, body temperature, the menstrual cycle, hair growth, energy levels, and more. It's what's called a master regulator, because the central role thyroid plays in virtually every organ system in the body, including the heart, the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, bone, and the gastrointestinal system. It's a very vital hormone. In particular, its negative impact that it has on iodine increases the person's risk for thyroid issues. You know, if we look back in the indigenous cultures way before the advent of toothpaste and toothbrushes, especially in Africa before they introduced sugars, they had very, very strong teeth. So much so that if you look at skeletal um, remains from uh, tens of thousands of years ago, from uh, you know that from Neanderthals to early Homo sapiens, you could still see all their teeth actually found in the fossils. Now, there are indeed some studies that have shown that adequate iodine intake may mitigate the adverse effects of fluoride on thyroid function. However, this does not mean that fluoride doesn't have an effect on our thyroid, or that we shouldn't be careful. Plus, how many people do you know that actively pay attention to this, measuring their iodine levels and maintaining adequate intake? It comes back down again to how the body utilizes minerals. Same with any bone structure. Right. I think the equivalent of giving somebody fluoride in toothpaste is that of giving somebody metal pins and stints in their bone structures when the bone structure starts to decay, hoping that that's going to resolve the situation. When in fact, we know that, you know, as soon as you start replacing any skeletal tissue with a metal, it may alleviate pain for the short run, but in the long run, it actually causes more atrophy of the tissue surrounding that area of a foreign body. And the same thing can be said for what goes on in our mouths. Thyroid problems are really widespread, and most people don't even know that they're experiencing any thyroid issues. 
And this is because thyroid imbalances usually manifest as things like fatigue, weight gain, constipation, dry skin, hair loss, menstrual irregularities, slowed heart rate, depression, and memory problems. Or in the case of an overactive thyroid, as things like severe weight loss, heat intolerance, diarrhea, fine tremor, and muscle weakness. So you see how easy it is to misattribute these symptoms to literally anything else. Also, when your thyroid hormones are out of whack, often your body doesn't deal with stress too well. And some things that are normally beneficial, such as intermittent fasting or cold plunges, can actually become harmful. So if you're into these kinds of hormesis producing activities, it might be a good idea to have a functional doctor check your thyroid levels. And even I've had to put a lot of effort into fixing my thyroid working with Justin. Although in my head, I've kept telling myself the story that I'm the perfect healthy person and I don't have to worry about anything because I'm living such a healthy lifestyle. Obviously I was wrong and my thyroid was completely messed up. So here are three things you might experience when drinking fluoridated water. The first thing that's going to be affected by that is your energy. Absolutely. So you're going to start experiencing midday slumps of energy, particularly mental energy. And this is where there's a bit of a, a crux because in certain scenarios, you might have an excess of physical energy, but poor access to mental energy, meaning that the body is very tense, but the mind is very, very slow. And this is quite a common sign with the increased intake of fluoride that a person can experience. This is the first and most dramatic symptom that will come from it is an imbalance between the energy in the brain and the energy in the body. It completely compromises fol active folate transport. So you get particular um, folate transport that enables uh, folate to go to the brain um, as well as for folate to be able to utilize in periods of pregnancy for neural tube development. It actually inhibits that whole folate um, transport protein. So in times of pregnancy, our expected mother may experience pregnancy depression. Because of the way in which um, fluoride increases the accumulation of aluminium, and subsequently what aluminium does to the pineal gland, it calcifies the pineal gland, compromising the pineal's ability to regulate the production of melatonin which has far more wide reaching effects than just compromised sleep because melatonin is the most powerful antioxidant to the, for the brain. And not to mention, it also helps to regulate process of detoxification from the liver. And there are more melatonin receptor sites in the gut than there are in the brain, which tells you a lot about its effective role in regulating the um, recovery and the regeneration of the gut in particular. So as if its effects on thyroid hormones and sleep patterns wasn't bad enough, fluoride exposure has been associated with concerns that include the possibility of triggering more serious health problems such as bone cancer, damage to the brain and cognitive impairment in children. There is actually a pretty notable study conducted in Canada in 2019 that found an association between higher fluoride exposure during pregnancy and lower IQ scores in children. But from a more mainstream approach, the overall body of evidence is of course still mixed here. So while fluoride does offer dental benefits, you now also understand the potential health risks involved and why it might not be the best idea to drink fluoridated water. Personally, I filter my drinking water, but not just because of fluoride, but because of all the many other contaminants found in tap water. And if water contaminants and how to avoid them is something you want to learn more about, then watch this video next.